Hi, it's Paul from Wicked Acorn. This is the Linotype building in Broad Heath. We've already done a video about it. There's a link up here if you want to see it. The Linotype is a complicated piece of machinery that was used in the printing industry. The Linotype was made in Broad Heath. Recently, a friend of ours told us about an antique shop in Stockport. It's in the old pear mill built by the renowned architectural firm Stott and Sons of Manchester. They were the leading northern cotton mill architects of the period. Coincidentally, they also built the linotype buildings in Broadheath. But that's not the only connection. This is Pear Mill, an Edwardian cotton spinning mill in Stockport, one of the last to be built. It commenced production in July 1913 and ceased operation as a textile mill in March 1978. It's now a grade two listed building and the home of the Vintage Emporium. They claim to be the biggest and best in Greater Manchester, with 60 traders in 15,000 square feet of retail space. They sell a huge variety of vintage and antique items. Furniture, fashion, decorative items, rare vinyl, and all kinds of weird and wonderful quirky items. There's a wonderful vintage tea room on site, and next to the tea room, there's a little nod to what Pear Mill used to be. I love places like this, although I have to admit I'm a window shopper. It's like a museum where you can buy the displays. When you get to a certain age and you go into places like this, it fills you with a nostalgic feeling. And at the same time, regret for throwing out that thing that's here for more than you have in your pocket. Now here's something that came up in a previous video we did about the Radium Girls in Sale and Altrincham. Somebody mentioned this stuff and I've never heard of it before. Uranium glass, having first been identified in 1789 by a German chemist, uranium was soon being added to glass for its fluorescent effect. It fluoresces under ultraviolet light or place it in a west-facing window and as daylight gives way to darkness it will glow. No lights on. The amount of uranium used is at trace levels so it is not hazardous. But what's all this got to do with linotype? Well, check this out. These are original drawings from the Linotype factory in Broad Heath. Okay, cue the elevator music. Now get ready for my best mid-transatlantic accent as I narrate this film from 1961 made for the 75th anniversary of Linotype. Though the Mergenthaler Linotype is a backstage piece of machinery seen only by people in the trade, its typefaces are seen by everybody. Great care is taken to design sharp, clear, legible faces. Designing a typeface is a true and distinctive art, the work necessarily of an artist, a master typographer. This step, the actual designing, is but the beginning the very first of many operations that will transform the ideas and skill of a typographer into the small brass matrices that will eventually mold the letters. Now the idea on paper is ready to be expressed in metal. This is a pantograph. A machine that cuts out the particular character in raised brass. The result is a master pattern, greatly reduced in size from the drawing, a pattern 
from which smaller steel punches can later be cut. Now the master pattern is used in a second pantograph operation. This is the punch, this small piece of steel that now has a character engraved on its tip, a character that will in turn stamp in the matrices. Each punch representing one character in an alphabet is filed away in this vault. Here, close to 1,000 languages and dialects are represented by these tiny pieces of steel. The work of many men and of many years, and in a way, a quiet reflection on the worldwide success of the Mergenthaler linotype. There must have been millions of these drawings. We've become so used to choosing different fonts nowadays. Just look at some of the ones I have on my desktop. Back in the day, somebody had to draw each and every character by hand. Hundreds of thousands of these drawings were probably on their way to the tip. But over 100,000 were salvaged from the demolition several years ago. Many have been on the market in various ways ever since, including a 2014 appearance on the BBC's Antiques Roadshow. They're quite lovely, and they'd really look great in a nice frame. A lot of thought and care had to go into designing a font. The typographer couldn't just draw what he fancied. He had to take into account the processes that would follow his own work. Let's zoom in on this character drawing. Here where the lines meet at a sharp angle, he had to incorporate an ink trap so the ink wouldn't pool in the corners and make the character look messy when printed. And all of that would be reduced down to a tiny letter on a page. The level of precision is mind-boggling. When the linotype came along, newspapers and magazines could have their own personalized font design. The linotype may be gone, but its legacy is still with us. Many of these fonts designed for the linotype are still in use.